Blog Talk Radio. Are you curious of what may go bump in the night? Or shadowy secrets that may never come to light? Then tune in to Disclosure Now. I'm your host, the Pied Piper, co-hosted by Texas Rebel. Tune in and let's get real. Brought to you by the Enlightenment Evolution Network. The opinions, commentary, and views that are expressed here at Disclosure Now or the guest of the show are not necessarily reflections of the view of the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Thank you for tuning in. This is Disclosure Now. I am your host, the Pied Piper. Tonight, Texas Rebel, your co-host, will not be with us. Uh, tonight, we're continuing the, the Billy Meyer debate, part two, titled The Skeptic. We have with us Philip Langdon, uh, who's a mathematician, uh, and he has thoroughly debunked uh, the Billy Meyer photographs, even using the same camera and equipment. Um, now, the Billy Meyer case, as you heard last week, uh, there was lots of information to go over, um, and we heard it sort of from the horse's mouth, uh, Michael Horn. So right now, I would like to introduce Philip Langdon, and uh, let's get this show on the road. How are you tonight, Philip? Hey, well, I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Right. So getting into this, uh, could you please explain uh, to the listeners uh, who you are and how you got involved with Michael and the Billy Meyer case? Yeah, um, I'll try and keep it short because it's quite a long story. But um, I mean, I first saw the case in 1994 when I was in university um, and I was studying all sorts of other things um, that I wasn't doing at university. And one of them was, was looking into UFOs. Um, inevitably, when you ever when you look at UFOs, you're always going to come across the Meyer case because it's supposed to be the the biggest case on record. Um, and of course, I saw it and I thought um, this this guy Billy Meyer is saying that he's um, he has proof that he's in touch with aliens. So I thought, well, I really want to see this proof. So I, I got hold of his films. Um, because I was expecting to see something really, really interesting in his films, and all I saw were wobbling models, you know, straight away. Um, there, was, there was nothing in it that was um, potentially interesting at all. Um, so I, I shelved it and I dropped it. Um, and years later, in 2009, that was in 1994, 95, and years later in 2009, I was on YouTube and I noticed a video called The Billy Meyer Case Reopened. So I had a look at it um, and I realized that uh, what I was seeing wasn't something that was worth looking at in the first place. And I didn't understand why they were trying to uh, re-promote this case. So I wrote to Michael Horn and said, what are you doing? You know, what is this? Um, Ground Saucer Watch debunked this in 1980. You know, that's years ago. How come 30 years later you're promoting this? And he came at me, at me with hammer and tongs. Um, and I, I suddenly realized that this guy was um, extremely uh, aggressive uh, and that something was wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to read you a, a small thing that he wrote at the end of an email. Um, hang on two seconds. I'm just going to call it up. Um, now, and I uh, quote. Was yeah. this was was this correspondence in the very the the very early beginning or way later after you guys have communicated a while? No, no, this is the very beginning. I hadn't done okay. anything about this at this point. This is 2009 in August, uh, and I first wrote to him. He wrote back. I wrote back to him saying, you know, you, you're talking to me like I'm an idiot, but I've actually got a degree in math, and I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then he he wrote back to me and. At the end of his email, he said, look, now to make this clear and simple, I'm quoting now, i.e. understandable even for you, only contact me again with factual proof 
pointing to the specific articles, translation, information, etc., that are incorrect, and only with your own photographs and films, etc., of your own model UFOs, including model wedding cakes. Right, so I thought, um, okay, let's, let's have a look online and see if anyone's actually debunked this. And I found uh, the Independent Investigations Group in California had had a good go at this case, and they had debunked this and that from it. They'd certainly given reasonable explanations as to what might be going on in the case, um, but they didn't go very far. And I also saw Cal Koff's work, and I thought that was very, very good. Um, it, was, it was sufficient. You know, what these people had done was sufficient. But because Michael Horn is so aggressive, he doesn't accept that. And when I say sufficient, I mean they had actually pointed out that the case was fake for, you know, for this or that reason. Um, but Michael Horn was still going. And I thought it, it needed something much more than what these people had done to, to pull the rug from under his feet. So um, I decided, actually, three days after he sent me the, the thing I've just quoted to you, three days later, I walked my mum's dog around the corner from her house, and I saw the actual lid that the wedding cake was made from for the first time in my entire life, and I had no idea they were there. So uh, I, all of a sudden, I got this sense of, like, providence, you know, and these lids were on, on the same containers outside this warehouse. And I thought, if I can get hold of those lids, maybe I can make that model, you know. So I went in and I asked them, can I have some of those lids? They said, yeah, you can have as many as you like. So I thought, oh, right, okay. So I took it home and I started looking at it and comparing it to the, the photographs of the wedding cake. And uh, I realized that all he'd done is glued Christmas balls onto it and a couple of tin lids and what have you, and that's it. And I also started recognizing some of the pieces that were on it. Uh, for instance, on the very base of it, there are the what, what's called eyelets. They're, they're little um, cylindrical pieces of bra sort of brass or copper um, that you use to, to – I think they, they, they make them – they, they have something to do with clothes or ma the manufacturing of clothes. Uh, I'm not okay with all that, but you can buy them as they look on the wedding cake in packs from your local shops. So, you know, the things that are on there are all um, locally uh, get atable. You can buy this stuff yourself if you go to your local hardware store, you know. So um, I, I realized that th this could be very easy to make, um, even though they made a huge noise about the fact that, I mean, Michael Horn especially, um, spent a lot of time pretending that nobody would even be able to make the wedding cake as a model because um, it would be impossible, you know, and I realized that that wasn't the case and I knew that if I made that, I'd be able to pull the rug from under his feet because he needs that. So I made it, you know, and, and it was it was fine. It was absolutely perfect as far as I was concerned. And then I thought, I'm not a photographer. So I can't go around taking pictures of these things because I have no idea what I'd be doing. So um, when I made it, I, I told Derek in, in California, look, can, can I send this to you? Uh, and you can get a professional photographer to, to take all the pictures of it and, and do everything else that needs to be done. Because I can't, because I don't know what I'm doing. But he, he wrote back straight away and said, well, look, Phil, you know, you did such a good job on the model and you've never made models before, why don't you try taking the photographs? So I said, okay, okay, that actually sounds like quite a bit of fun. So, <laughs> so I did, um, and I started experimenting. You know, I had to learn how to be a photographer in the first place. I had to learn about photography, um, and I had to just, just do whatever I thought would give me the result that I see in, in Billy Meyer's pictures. And um, it became very quickly obvious that uh, Maya had, had just done the, the simplest and the easiest thing he possibly could. You know, I mean, I can break down the wedding cake photographs for you if you want, because there's only three types. Yeah, go ahead. That. Yeah, why don't you uh, uh, break, down, break down the wedding cake? And also, since we're at this part in the story, uh, Michael mentioned something on the show specifically. Now, he was kind of a gentleman when he was on. He kind of poked a finger at the UFO community a little bit, but he was a gentleman, um, and he he seemed to respect you on the air. Um, but he did say that he helped you 
can, can you go into detail on that real fast <laughs> and then go into the, the wedding cake UFO? Yeah, uh, he helped me. No, he didn't help me at all. Um, that, that, that's not correct. When he says he helped me, uh, what he's, he's talking about is that he wrote to me, uh, goading me, um, you know, making fun of me basically saying, ah, oh, that's rubbish, you haven't done this right, you haven't done that right, how about this, how about that, you, you should be doing You should be doing something completely different. Um, so he, he, um, he didn't help me at all, he, he didn't give me any advice on, on what, um, what the best thing to do was, you know, because he didn't want to encourage the idea that, that Maya took photographs of a model, you know. Um, so... I'm sorry that I've lost track. What, what, what exactly did you want to know other than whether okay. Michael Horn helped me? Uh, just to break down the wedding cake UFO, uh, like you said, the three different versions you had. Ah, uh, the three different photographs. Okay. So the, the easiest pictures to take, are uh, so you, you just grab the model, you and, can pick it up with one hand. Sorry. Uh, real quick, r real quick. I wanted to tell everybody too that uh, after the show, I'm going to be uploading a 1080p slideshow uh, with all of these photographs for your reference. So if you've enjoyed the show tonight and you want to see these for yourself, uh, there will be a slideshow coming on uh, within a few days after the show. Go ahead, Philip. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, I was going to say the the first photographs I tried were the easiest because he's got three types of pictures with the wedding cake. Uh, one set he took outside his own front door, um, literally sitting on a tabletop um, where the, the tabletop isn't in the frame. He avoids it. Uh, in fact, in one of his most famous pictures outside his front door, you can actually see the top of the tabletop that it's sitting on in one of those pictures. Um, the, the second group of pictures he took was uh, a series where the wedding cake is, is what looks like it, it's just stuck next to a little tree in every single picture outside in this field. Um, and the, the last set of pictures he took uh, was the, the nighttime pictures um, where the wedding cake appears to be gold. Okay, so we can, we can go through those in a bit. Um, the ones outside his front door are the easiest because you simply put it on a tabletop and you, you aim the camera at it. It's about three feet away from you the whole time, that's it and you, you turn it around a little to get a few interesting angles and you make it look like it's moving a little bit, you know, but just by changing your position slightly. Um, so they were really, really easy to replicate. Um, the only issue that uh, I had at the time was because I wasn't a photographer and because I was learning about photography, I didn't realize that um, using a roll of slide film would make such a difference. And it, it makes a huge difference. People don't realize this when they're looking at his photographs, but he always used slide rolls of film, otherwise known as diapositives. They, they're not the same as negatives at all. They give you a very, very good contrast, um, beautiful colors. Uh, certain things happen. If, if the sun is in the frame and you're using slide roll, it, it bleaches out the sky. So you can actually tell when someone's used a slide roll as opposed to a, a roll of negatives um, just by looking at these, these qualities. So um, I didn't use slide rolls initially. I was using a, a seven megapixel digital camera um, and a cheap Canon plastic autofocus camera uh, from 1981. Um, and I was loading negative rolls in that. So that's what I was using initially. And the results weren't that great. But I could see when I use digital photography, the results were better than when I use the negatives. But that turned out to be um, more to do with the lens on the camera than anything else. The uh, Canon autofocus had a really cheap plastic lens on it, and the, the quality of the pictures it gave me was, was very, very poor. So I had to stick to digital photography. And it, funnily enough, it wasn't until later on when I did slides that I noticed that digital photography is very, very similar in its results to slides. They, they look very similar. It gives you the same sort of great color, great contrast, et cetera, et cetera. So I was, I was doing the right sort of thing by using a digital camera. Um, I've been accused several times of using Photoshop because I used a digital camera, um, but that's just completely unnecessary. You don't need Photoshop to reproduce anything that Maya has done. Anyway, so... 
um, I, I did these photographs outside my own house at the time, and uh, they, they came out looking pretty close to the ones that Maya had taken. Um, so the next step was to, to try and figure out how to get it um, to stick close to a, a small tree. You know, um, Kalkoff thought that Maya had suspended it. Um, but I thought, no, no, it, it can't be that because the, the scenery that he'd taken the uh, the wedding cake photographs in next to the tree was such that it, it would be very, very um, involved to suspend it. You could do it. You know, it can be done, but you did it. maybe there's a simpler method. And it turned out to be my mum, my mother, who suggested that a piece that I'd bought um, to to um, support the wedding cake on the underneath of it. I, I was I was going to attach this piece to the tree trunk. I was going to rest the wedding cake uh, hull, the edge of the hull, on this thing, and I was going to use a bit of fishing line tied around the tree, tied into the top part of the wedding cake to to sort of hold it in place. But when I did that, um, the, the weight of it, because um, my version of it weighed two kilograms. Um, pulled the top out of sync, so it kind of ruined the model. Um, so I had to rebuild it again, and uh, my mum suggested I use the same piece as a hook, because un on the underside of this wedding cake thing, on, on the underside of the lid, is a groove uh, that you can slide like a hook into, you know? And when she told me that, I thought, no, that's never going to work, of course, because it's two kilograms. Surely it would just fall off. So I thought, okay, I've got nothing else to try. So I screwed this thing into my tree trunk and I, I popped the wedding cake onto it. And for some reason, it, it just stayed there. That was it. It was horizontal. It was um, fully supported. And uh, you, you could knock it with your hand and it wouldn't fall off. So all of a sudden, I've got the method um, to reproduce every single tree shot that he ever did with the wedding cake. Uh, I, gra I got a, a really large spruce tree and chopped it down to the size that it should have been to match the scale of the wedding cake model. And uh, I just walked it around to the fields around the corner from where I lived. Uh, I, I took some photographs and most of them looked really, really good, you know. Um, so I realized that it, it was a question of framing them exactly as he'd framed them now that I'd figured out that this is what you do. So um, I did all the tree shots. At every single one of them, really. Um, I only missed a couple because um, I didn't have every single wedding cake photograph ever produced. I didn't want to buy the CD they had on offer. It was $25, and I just didn't want to give Michael Hall any money. Um, so the, the photographs I had to work with were the, were the freebies that were available on the Internet at the time. Well, speaking so, of that, um, speaking yeah. of that real, real quick, uh, Philip, uh, <laughs> um I actually did give Michael Horn some money, not to come on the show or anything. You know, it's a it's a free gig, of course. You know, I uh, we're not some big conglomerate or anything, but um, I did yeah. want to watch. I did want to watch. I saw the Silent Revolution of Truth, and I did want to see his newest movie because I imagined he'd be speaking on it. So to be a good host, I'd like to talk on it, and I needed it. Well, I asked him, and I ended up uh, purchasing it, which I got a digital download for. So. Um, uh, different than your case, uh, I was out, I think, 13 bucks. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, one other thing. I wanted to <laughs> discuss with you that gold um, wedding cake UFO, the photo where supposedly Billy is sitting on, you know, the outer rim of a UFO. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's just unbelievable to think he'd be sitting on the side of a flying saucer. But anyway, supposedly when you en en enhance the contrast on that photo, you see something strange where the where the wedding cake UFO actually is, and then you see a road underneath. Now, you can get into what that uh, aberration is in the film at the top by the wedding cake, but my question to you would be the road underneath. Now, Michael says this photo was taken long ago, and this kind of proves that everybody was wrong because, look, there's a road underneath this UFO that you couldn't see before computers and Photoshop to turn up the gain or, or whatever. And my question is, do you think that road is a model? And if it's not a model of the road, how would that photo have been done now that you can see the road underneath? And Michael also says that every skeptic has ran away since the new wedding cake 
information has come out from Zowie, uh, Dr. Zowie, that everybody's ran away. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry, Philip. Yeah, everybody's run away. Yeah, that, that, that's nonsense, guys. That's nonsense, dude. Um, that shot, I can explain. I, I need to explain, first of all, um, why the wedding cake is gold at night. You know, um, And this is something that anybody can do right now and test it within a few seconds. Um, anybody listening to this in the future can test it right now. If you go into your kitchen and you grab a, a saucepan or a frying pan or anything that's shiny silver, Take it into a room where the curtains are closed or hopefully if the sun is down, you've got an artificial light on. So get your camera or a, a mobile phone and look at the silver object under artificial light and ask yourself, what color is it? It will be now, gold. Yes, I can, I can actually say you are 100% correct. I have a camera that is uh, it's, it's almost like a small little GoPro. You can take 12 meg megapixel pictures with it and also do 1080p video. Well, it doesn't have a flash on it. I have artificial light in my living room, and when I crank it up and I take a picture, everything looks orange. Go ahead. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what we're looking at in his nighttime photographs. Um, I, I, before I did that, I had no idea how to do those nighttime photographs because I'm not into photography. I didn't know that artificial light does that. So I, I took these night photographs to a, a professional photographer friend of my father. And um, he, he, the instance he looked at these Maya photographs, he laughed, first of all. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, well, this is a model lit by spotlights. And he said, look, you can even see the reflection of the spotlights in the model. So I, I, I didn't believe him, to be honest. I didn't think it was that simple. So when I actually tried it and realized it was that simple, I laughed as well, you know, because it, it, it all just turned out to be so simple. Um, the, uh, before I talk about that, that photograph that you just mentioned that, that Michael Horn says everybody runs away from, um, it's really important um, to realize that when I start, I, the first time I did some test shots of uh, the, the nighttime type shots that Maya took, um, I had spotlights on, you know, like house, you know, um, table lamps, basically. Um, I used about five or six table lamps. And um, I, I didn't know um, how to suspend it or support it. This was actually before I did the tree shots and realized that I could hook it onto a, a, a tree or a pole or something. I didn't know that at the time. So I was suspending it. And I was trying to figure out how to um, prevent the suspension line from showing up in every, every one of the shots I was taking. So I was kind of bamboozled at that time. But when I realized that I could hook it onto a tree, it suddenly occurred to me that when I, when I was looking at his nighttime pictures, the, the wedding cake always seems to have the same orientation toward the camera, um, as if it's doing it with confidence, you know, because when you suspend this thing with a, with a, a filamentary line, it keeps spinning around and it never stops. You have to stop it with your hand, but as soon as you stopped it, it starts up again. So I wondered how he, had the, he got the same orientation for all his nighttime shots. If you hook it onto a pole, it's not going to spin, and you can maintain um, the orientation, but you've got the issue of the pole possibly showing up in the film. So I just cut a piece of black um, uh, fabric and I, I, I put it over the pole and I hooked it behind with two uh, clothes pegs. Um, and all of a sudden, I, I took some pictures, I got them back from the shop, and the pole and the, 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 the fabric covering the pole made the pole disappear completely. It was just completely black. But when I uh, filled the light on my computer, I filled the light to see how much of the pole it was actually showing or registered in the film in the first place. And all of a sudden, you can see the fabric. And you can see folds in the fabric as well. So when we look at this, this, um, this photograph that Michael Horn is parading around at the moment uh, from Mr. Raul Zahi, um, he's saying that because there's nothing underneath the wedding cake, it can't be supported. Therefore, there's no support method. Therefore, it's a genuine UFO. That's ridiculous because um, he completely ignores, obviously on purpose, what's going on above the wedding cake in that shot. If you look at the very top of the wedding cake in that shot, just the right-hand side, you'll see two folds 
of what look, can only be fabric. And you need to ask yourself, why is there fabric above this thing? Um, I, I recently read their report on this photograph, and they're saying that this, this what looks to me like a blanket or a piece of fabric hanging down, um, and it extends to the left and the right side of the wedding cake, they're saying that's a plasma field, right? I'm saying that is a blanket or a piece of cloth that Mr. Meyer has hung down to prevent us from seeing the um, support method that comes down from above. It's just as easy to support it from above as it is from below because um, you're going to be hooking it on and the hook is a small object that you can screw to anything, anything you can screw it onto. It could be something coming down from above, something coming up from below. It doesn't matter. So in that picture, I believe Billy Meyer has supported his wedding cake from above um, so that there's nothing underneath. And the road underneath and that pole are all genuine. They're fine. They're actually unseen. I'm sure they are. There's no need to create those as models because that's just going too far. Meyer never does that. He never does anything complicated. Um, he's basically a stage magician, you know, like an illusionist. They always yeah. use the simplest tricks. They always use the simplest tricks. And it's got to be simple because the, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to hide and the harder it is to uh, explain away. So uh, this is a very, very simple picture to explain. It's supported from above and he's, he's, he's draped some kind of fabric down there um, that you didn't see in the, in the in the 80s when he took the pictures originally, um, uh, to, just to, to hide the support method. That's it. So there's the explanation for that <clears throat> photograph. Right. So that basically that basically throws out you know like at, in the same photo of the gold wedding cake where you can see the road underneath. You take another photo that he did of the wedding cake and you brighten it up and well instead of a road you see fabric bunched up with sitting on correct. Sorry, so you see you see fabric that it's sitting on. Sorry. Yeah, or a fabric that's bunched up. The same way you see the yes. road in the one picture that they're saying this proves it. You can do the opposite and say, well, if you turn up the gain on this other one, you can see fabric. Correct. That's what you're saying. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm, what? I'm would... actually get. Sorry, Go I was ahead. just going to say I, I gave I gave you a picture a couple of days ago of um, one of my shots. Um, uh, of the, the the gold wedding cake at night, and it was sitting on a box that was uh, a cardboard box that I put um, a black piece of um, fabric on, and that's got loads and loads of excuse me, loads and loads of folds in it, and and they yes. look exactly like the thing in their picture. Yes, absolutely, and uh, something that that Michael Horn says and repeats sort of. Um, he says that uh, Billy Meyer would have to be a master of 30 different fields to amass and hoax all the evidence, let alone to have hoaxed everything one-armed. What would be your response to that? Well, how many fields am I an expert in? Right. From what I understand, how, many fields, how many fields are you an expert in? I'm an expert yeah. in one field. That's mathematics. Right. That's it. Yeah, that's I'm it. an expert. And yet... I, I, uh, say I'm an expert in zero, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not true, dude. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, if you get, if he's going to say you're going to be an expert in 30 different fields, that that's just exaggerating. Um, if if I've replicated all of his photo sets completely and all of his films completely to the the last detail. And I'm only an expert in one thing that has nothing to do with this material. You don't need to be an expert in any of it. And he, he's not even that good a photographer. If you look at his early pictures, they're, they're pretty poor, really. You can see um, during the course of 1975 and 1976 that he got better at it. You see, he, he got better at it. He found out how to do it better. So um, the, the early pictures are the ones that they don't promote so much, and then the later pictures are the ones they do promote because they look better. Well, kind of what, what Michael Horn was doing on, my, on the, episode that, the last episode that he came on, um, <clears throat> basically is he was kind of putting to bed all the photographs. Um, 
One of the excuses, and we'll probably get into this later when we talk about a few other of the photos, but um, uh, that basically Billy uh, just took his rolls of film, got them developed somewhere, and he threw them in a shoebox. And some of those, um, some of those were intercepted by intelligence agencies and hoaxes put in its place which really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If I mean, they could have assassinated him and got rid of the whole story. Um, but anyway, that's that's one of the things that, that he says, is that, you know, the <clears throat> some of the photos were hoaxed on him. Like, as an example, the, the photo where <clears throat> supposedly he was on another planet or back in time and he saw a, tr- a pterosaur or whatever dropping, feeding babies or something, and that picture turned out to be in a book. Well, he basically said he's not promoting any of the pictures anymore. It's all about the prophecies, pretty much, in the message. What would you say about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know why? Because I did this stuff. Ever since I've done this stuff, everything has changed. And the reason it's changed is because I was thorough. Okay? That's why Michael Horn's website is completely different now. That's why they constantly say, hey, Phil, it's not about the photographs. It's about the spiritual message and the prophecies. Yeah, right. So why do they keep promoting the photographs to this day? Because the photographs are what they call eye candy. They're the things that drag people in. And then when someone is dragged in, they can start filling them in on whatever, whatever they like. You know? So they're still using the photographs as, um, as a means of, of hooking people in. So it is still about the photographs. So so what are they saying? You know what I mean? This is a contradiction of which there yeah. are many in this case. Yes, absolutely. One of the contradictions that I found is that, first of all, you need to be leery and uh, uh, very skeptical of any individual that claims to have divinity, meaning as in, you know, my soul is Jesus, which is actually Emmanuel, or I'm Mohammed, or... You know, anything like that you need to be extremely skeptical of. But uh, there's a lot of stuff. Like, if this is not a religion, uh, and we'll discuss this with uh, Michael if the third show uh, materializes here, uh, that, you know, if it's not a religion, why involve Jesus? Why bring up the scrolls? Why have uh, a religious-type message? Even if you're screaming non-religious or um, non-denomination, then... I mean, the structure is still religious. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think it is um, presented and um, constructed as, as though it's some kind of religion. Um, I, I don't know whether I can comment too much on such things because uh, my, my part in this was to really test his evidence. Um, so that's what I was focused on. Um, okay. You know, I actually went in, I must say this, I actually went into this saying to myself, look, Phil, if, if you can't, if I can't reproduce um, anything from his photographic or film evidence, if there's something that I find is absolutely impossible to reproduce, I will put my hands up online in public and say, I couldn't do this, I think it's impossible, there might be something to this case after all. Okay, I, I actually said that to myself because when, when you're being scientific, um, you, you can't have bias, even though I, in my heart I, I thought and I knew that it was probably, you know, all nonsense. Um, I, I really had to put that to one side and say, I've got to test this properly because I, I need to be if you're going to do this, you may as well do it properly, you know, and you can only be taken seriously if you do this properly. Okay, so so. Um, for my part, I, I never really um, dealt with the religious aspect of this or the he met Jesus and, and didn't get his photograph and all this sort of thing. I documented that a little bit in my videos on YouTube, but I'm really focused on the pictures and the films. So I, I can't really talk about prophecies uh, and what have you, you know, because it, it's very difficult to test those sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, and besides, that. Sorry, sorry. Abs- I, I was just going to say, fine, fine. Finally, I'm just going to say that um, Derek uh, did touch, Derek Bartholomus at IG West, he did touch on the prophetic nature of Maya's stuff, and uh, it came out wanting. Yeah, well, um, 
I appreciate the scientific approach because, you know, you you kept bias out of it. You had a hypothesis, which was it was a fraud, but you did your due diligence to come to that conclusion. So I, I appreciate Absolutely. your work. Absolutely. But, um, it has to be that way. You know, you, you must do this thing. Um, you, you must be unbiased in your approach and, and really admit when you can't do something. Uh, but, but that never happened. You know, because it turned out that all his stuff is extremely simple. The only thing is that you need to know precisely what he's done. Even though it's simple, you still need to know what he's done. You, you, you can't just mock it up and pretend that you've reproduced his stuff. You've actually got to look at the tiniest details in his films in particular and ask yourself, do I have those details in my film? Is this technique um, answering all the questions that need to be answered. You see? Yeah, well, when it comes to math, uh, <laughs> I can guarantee you're superior than me. I've got about an algebra knowledge base. Uh, when you started doing some of those videos where you actually had the crafts coming in from the horizon, as Billy did, um, I, I, I know in the video you showed how it could be done one-handed. How did you approach that? Did you first go mathematically, do it all mathematically, and then go out to, into the field and start? How did that happen? How did that? How did you materialize uh, that? Well, uh, maths doesn't really have anything to do with this, but the the concept of mathematics is logic, and logic has everything to do with this. Absolutely everything. So um, if, if you just ask yourself, if someone gave you these eight movies that Billy Meyer took and, and they asked you, how would you reproduce these? How would you go about it? What, what would you think? How, how do you start? Where do you start? What do you do? So you, you need to think, well, um, I, I did the photography first and I went and moved on to the films because um, I recognized that if I can get the photographs, the techniques that are being used to make the photographs are probably the same or very similar techniques to make the films. So I established, first of all, what was needed to get these um, photographic sessions done. And it turned out that I could do all of them with the, the two methods of suspension. One of those methods is horizontal suspension between two different trees across an open space. And the other method is direct vertical suspension from a tree branch above you that's going to be out of the frame when you take a picture or a film. So those are the two techniques he used. There's a third technique, which is halfway between the two. And that is, and he only used this once in one movie. And that is a, a, a diagonal line from um, something on the ground, like a fence post. He, I, I think he used a fence post. Uh, you, and you draw the line up and you take it over a tree branch about 16 feet up. That's it. So there's one film with that unique technique. All the other films and photographs are taken with horizontal or vertical suspension. And that's it. It's that simple. So um, when I approached doing the films, I actually wrote down uh, or drew on, on A4 sheets of paper what I thought was going on. And I drew as I, I, I really, really I tried to come up with as many possible techniques and ideas as I could. But there, there just never were that many. So um, I had a small handful of ideas to try out. And I went out and I tried every single one of them to make sure that there was nothing missing so that, um, you know, I, I had to be thorough, basically. So I did that. And as I was doing that, I started to recognize things I had seen in his films that were right in front of me. And then slowly you realize that everything has to be simple, simple, you know, really simple. And then yeah. you get it. Well, one of the simple, simple things that he did was forced perspective. Can you explain that a little bit and how you incorporate that into getting some of these photos? Yeah, um, the false perspective thing um, is very interesting because uh, when you look at his photographs, you, it, it takes a while to get used to uh, understanding that the, the, the UFO in the picture is actually only a few feet away from him. So when you realize that, you start to um, be able to set up the, um, the setup itself in a field 
correctly. So because you know now that you're going to be standing seven to ten feet away from your model and you need the background to be there. Uh, and then you, you, you just do a photo session like that. You know, and when you take the pictures, you get them back from the shop. When you look at the pictures, the first thing that really shocked me was, um, see, I, I had his camera. Uh, I actually bought the exact camera that he used um, from eBay for £1.50, which is about $2.50. You know, I got lucky. I didn't have to bid for it. Others, other times, the camera went for 30 or £40, pounds, which is about 60 or $70 dollars. And I was, I was looking to have to spend that kind of money, but I got lucky. Um, so there's me with his camera and a model that looks exactly like his because they're really easy to make as well. Um, and I took, I took a whole set of photographs. I took another set and I got them back from the shop. And would you believe it? What I saw in the viewfinder was a much closer and bigger version of what was on the print when I got it back from the shop. And all of a sudden, I realized that his, his biggest secret, and, and nobody seems to talk about this, I don't know why, but his biggest secret is that camera. It's got a wide-angle lens on it, so it takes in an awful lot of the scenic view of where you are, and it squashes it down onto a rectangular plate. The result of doing that is that your model all of a sudden is much smaller in, in the print when you get it back from the shop than you remember seeing when you look through the viewfinder. So this camera is his secret and that's why they never talk about it. They don't want you to know that the pictures create themselves. In other words, Billy Meyer is not even clever. He, he, <laughs> he's got a, you see, he, he's, it's his equipment that's doing the job for him. You see what right. I mean? And it's the same thing with his film camera. Exactly the same thing applies to his film camera. I can see when I watch his videos that his video camera that he used in the 70s, not video camera, obviously, but the old film-type cameras, also has a wide-angle lens. And that's going to squash everything down and make things look much further away than they really are. Okay, yeah. so, so there's his secret, in a nutshell. Well, um, one question that I have, and uh, I started, you know, uh, preparing for the show. I, I went into the, the Billy Meyer case and everything, and uh, the photos were one thing, and it kind of drew me in a little more, and I thought, oh, I saw that ray gun, that horrible, horrible toy gun that looked like a horrible <laughs> Star Trek. It did. It looked like a horrible Star Trek prop that didn't make it to the screen because it was just too lame. Like, I mean, yeah. it. It, it it looks absolutely horrible. It looks like let me okay, let me put a little perspective on this. It looks like uh what somebody in the early sixties, later or early, early seventies would think high tech would look like. So that's what he produced to show on camera. It's clearly that is clearly a a a, a fraud. It is not from outer space. And anyway, I asked Michael about that, and Wendell Stevens, and there was another investigator there at the time, he said they were, like, up over the bluff, and then, bang, he shot the gun, and the aliens, poof, you know, showed up in no time and took it back, and then here comes Wendell Stevens, and sure enough, you know, all that stuff was done a few seconds before they came up over the hill. D do you know anything about that, or the ray gun photos themselves? I don't know what all photos you've been over. Um, well, I only covered that uh, minimally um, to sort of include it as a sort of joke in the uh, the first video I put out um, in this UFO bus series. Um, it, it's basically just to have a laugh because obviously we can't take that seriously. You know, it, it looks like a children's toy. I think he put it together from bits and pieces he had lying around, and that's why you can't find it in any catalog. Some people actually try to find it in catalogs, but you're never going to do that because he made it himself, because he's, he's, he's into arts and crafts, Billy Meyer. You know, he's extremely adept with his one hand. He had, what, 15 years before taking this stuff to become very, very adept at using just one hand to do things. He's a well, very absolutely. skillful bloke with his hands. But he's not that clever. But was that before or after he met Saddam Hussein? <laughs> 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 well, I'm just saying, man, this this, this story is just uh, phenomenal in many cases. Like, if uh, if this story was 100% factual, let's say me and 
like, you know, my observation of the case right now and uh, your standing observation of the case, basically, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's just so fraudulent. It's, it's, it's not even funny. Um, looking at it now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the whole Ray gun thing. And then it, it almost looked like Billy was in that photo. Like it was a beard, not a, uh, not hair that was in that photo. I don't know. I, I, I took a quick peek at it, but, uh, you can't you, you take those. The... Go ahead. Do, do you mean the photograph with the, the lady with the, you know, the long, the, the, um, the curly black hair who's holding the gun in the suit, in the golden suit? Yes, and half the photograph is clipped, so you can't see the actual person standing there. Just the, you know, the hair and the and the gun and the arm and stuff. Yes. Right. Uh, apparently, I was reading up on that. Funnily enough, just this week, and it, it turns out someone reckons that um, that gold suit was something that was readily available um, everywhere in Switzerland. It, it seems to be some kind of regular suit that somebody would wear for some function in particular. I can't remember what they said. Um, but, um, yeah, this person reckoned that anyone could get one of those things, so there's nothing special about it. I, I don't know whether but, that lady was a real human being or not, or whether it was a dummy. I think I think it was a dummy because the hand position was the same each time. I mean, exactly the same. And the arm and the elbow bend and everything about it. And I don't know where he'd get a dummy from. You know, it, it's not up to me to answer these things. I, I don't know what he does all the time, you know, but um, it was such yeah, a but, joke. It's not something I, I really focused on at all because it was just too silly. Right. Well, w what I was thinking is that if this case is 100% factual, you're wrong and I'm wrong or whatever, and it's all real, uh, holy, holy cow, he, he could have a book written just on the stuff before all the UFO stuff came into it. Now, I realize he says he was, yeah. you know, abducted or talked to as a child, but the 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 part of his life where he leaves home and all that's I mean that's a that's a blockbuster movie just that without ET in it. <laughs> yeah, I I agree, man. I mean they could make a film of his life, and, and the, I'm sure Michael Horn has got a plan to make a film of Billy Meyer's life like that and try and present it as if it's the next Hollywood blockbuster. Because I mean, did, so, did you, have you seen his website? Have you seen his website recently? Uh, uh, yes, I have. Have you seen? Well, you see is, the first is his, thing that's on that page is his is his idea is to beat a dead horse until it neighs into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the first thing that they they've got on theyfly.com at the moment is uh, a picture taken of Times Square showing uh, what yes. looks to be a, a press announcement with a picture of the wedding cake, and it says, "Hang on, two seconds, because I've actually got it up. Hang on, let me just read it to you quickly." Uh, here it is. Here it is. Uh, where's it going? Where's it going? Um, let's go to the top of the page. Uh, oh, damn, I've lost it there. Hang on, I'm just going to call it up. Yeah, there's an announcement about the uh, the web. It says, oh, here it is, here it is. Uh, here's the announcement. Authentic 1981 UFO photo of Maya. Warned of 9-11 Ebola epidemic by extraterrestrials in 1987. Uh, and above that, it says PR Newswire. So when I saw this the other day, the first thing I did was Google PR Newswire. And I went on their website. And it says, if you'd like us to show your press release at Times Square, contact us here. So obviously, Michael Horn has, has um, pretended to have a pre you know, an official press release as if he can do such a thing. Um, and he's just basically paid to have it shown in Times Square. And I guess, you know, people walking around in Times Square at the time just wouldn't even notice or they go, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's cute, and walk off and forget about it. So he's taken a picture of it and put it on the top of his website to pretend that this is a real, you know, news issue, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can I can run an ad in the paper, you know, that doesn't make the ad true. That's for sure. Uh, right. You know. Uh, you know. I, I was unsure about this case. As a matter of fact, I kept digging. And uh, Michael's right about one thing, though. When you do type in the Billy Meyer stuff, the debunking stuff comes up first. He says that's by design. <laughs> um, but. Uh, oh man. Yeah, yeah. He, he <laughs> said that. He, he said that was kind of by design. But I tell you what. What I forced me over the. I tell you what forced me over the edge, you know, there was a couple things. One, 
was the fact that Billy has people living in his on his ranch or his property. Uh, number two was that damn gun. You just can't. You just look at it and it screams preschool. Um, and uh, the third fact was that Billy's own family members, his ex-wife now, ex-wives <laughs> can say anything. So I don't put credibility on that. But his own son, his youngest son, I think it is. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he came out and said that his his Methuselah. father's. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, Methuselah Maya. Yeah. Go 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 ahead and tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I got in touch with Methuselah. Uh, somebody uh, nudged me one day and said, "Hey, Billy, one of Billy Maya's sons is online, claiming that uh, Figu are, are basically no good. They're up to no good." Um, so I had a look and I thought, "Wow, I really didn't expect to see anything like that." So I got in touch with him. And he got in touch with me eventually. It took about three months because he, he's quite a busy guy and he moves around a lot. Um, it, it didn't really come to anything other than we had a nice little discussion. And he said, yeah, yeah, I like your, your, your videos, Phil. I like what you've done. Um, and that was about it, basically. You know, so nothing more happened. He's a nice guy. I've, I've got him in, in uh, Google circles. Um, so I could talk to him any time if I wanted to. But, you know, um, He's a, he's a busy guy, and um, that was about it, to be honest. There's nothing really more to say about that. Yeah, well, it just it was shocking to me to have his own family come forward and say, "Hey, you know, this is uh, this is underhanded." And it wasn't just one family member; it was it was a couple of them. Uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, Ron, uh, Ron L. Hubbard's uh, great grandson. He preaches or not preaches, but he speaks out about Scientology and and the dangers of it. And speaking of the dangers of religion, uh, Billy has kind of, I mean, he has, he's woven a religion around this UFO tale and UFO contactee story. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's got people living on his ranch. This is what I found disturbing. I asked Michael about it and he said something to the effect that, you know, Billy's soul has been, you know, Emmanuel and all these people. And during those lifetimes, they connected with other souls, and those souls either did something wrong or they're trying to make up for stuff. And uh, I was getting cut out of my own show. I, was, I kept getting dropped. So Michael was the only one in the room, and I couldn't hear him talk. So basically, I, I, I missed the question. I missed his answer. I thought he didn't answer it, but he actually did. I went back and re-listened. And that's actually dangerous. Like, you have people that feel... Uh, there's something wrong with them, and they're going to go to Billy, and Billy's going to uh, remove this negativity or remove this from them and, and you know, just do as I say and everything's going to be good or, or follow these these beliefs. I, I, I find that uh, dangerous and reckless. Uh, what what do you think about that? Now, I know that doesn't have to do with pictures. This is just a personal opinion or thought you may have. That's fine. In fact, um, you, you come to an issue that I wanted to raise. Uh, because in the five years that I've been doing this, uh, I've really come to know uh, this guy, Billy Meyer, as um, a joker. And uh, I, I don't think he takes life that seriously. You know, and as a result, um, there, there are some jokes in this case that are there on purpose. Let me give you an example. I'll give you two examples, actually. Um, Billy Meyer's name is Billy Edward Albert Meyer, uh, if you look at the initials there, it's B-E-A-M, and that spells the word beam. So when he says he's taking photographs of beam oh. chips... What, oh, you my God. He, he, he's, he, he's, 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 taking pictures of his own, he's taking pictures of yeah, his own was, ship. It's his abbreviation. Right, Be, because, because oh. it's, it, it, it's actually acceptable for him to say, I, I take pictures of beam chips. He'll get away with a lie detector test on that particular question, because that's exactly what he's doing. He's taking pictures of the ships that he made. They're <laughs> his. You see, that, that, that's, that's one example. Let me give you another one that's good, probably going to make you laugh even more. Um, the, the young ladies he took photographs of uh, that he um, said are, are these alien friends of his. One of those Asket. ladies he calls As Asket. That's it, Asket and Nera. Right, those pictures are from the Dean Martin show reruns that were on in Europe at the time. Um, he, he obviously took a picture of the uh, of a TV screen, and he's got he took three of them. And um, for I think that was in 1975 he took those pictures. When um, 
1996, it was finally discovered who they were, and I think it was Cal Corp who discovered that the ladies were from the, Bean, uh, the, um, uh, the Dean Martin show. And on the Dean Martin show, they are in a dance troupe called the Dingalings. Right now, the the abbreviate the, the initials of Dingaling are D A L. And Billy says that these ladies and his friends associated with them come from the Dal universe. In other oh. words, they come from the Dingaling um, Dean Martin universe. So he's a joker. You see what wow. I'm saying? He, he's just play, he's just playing jokes on people. Well, it, like what, what, he just doesn't take it seriously, and he does it. It doesn't seem to bother him that well, um, the, some people in America. Sorry, I just I'm just got to say, some people have actually sent their children by themselves to this guy to learn from him, so that when the child has learned what they need to learn, they go home to their parents and explain it to their parents. I know he, he doesn't. He just doesn't seem to care about what effect he's having on people because he just doesn't take anything seriously. Yeah, now uh, I let I will let Michael answer himself on, on the third episode uh, if we can get that done. Uh, but his answer to me about some of those photos was that you know, uh, not necessarily the CIA, but but uh, intelligence agencies intercepted his photos and put bogus ones in. So that photo of Asket and stuff like that that's a that's a fake photo that was that was given to Billy through the mail that was intercepted. And same thing with the dinosaur photo um, and things like that. What would you say to that? that? That's a red herring of an excuse, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at the actual facts, and you, if you look at um, Contact from the Pleiades, uh, this film that was is quite famous, that where uh, at one point, I don't know, about an hour into it, um, Wendell Stevens is talking to Billy Meyer in Billy Meyer's bedroom. If you look at the wall, he's got the picture of Asket, so-called, on his wall. And it's that picture um, that 16 years after he took it was discovered to be Michel de la Fave from the, the Dingalings. When it was discovered who it was, that's when he came out with this story that it was um, supplanted by the men in black. You know? Now that... So, I was going to say, on. that... that that reminds me of the tree. Now, in many of his videos where it's swir- where his UFOs will kind of swirl or tilt around a tree in a pendulum type motion, uh, which there was a Zowie looked at that one. You could discuss that in a second. Uh, but that tree actually never existed. It can't be in multiple places at the same time with the same notch in it. And uh, supposedly there was a when they found out that tree didn't exist. Well, they went back in time because the tree was irradiated and never made it exist. Can you explain that? I, I know you've got to know this one, too. Absolutely. <laughs> this one's quite funny uh, because um, if you look at his sequence, he took 10 photographs in a place called Fusbuhl. It's a really strange name for a place. Um, and uh, here's another point that I wanted to raise earlier, but I, I didn't get around to it, and we'll probably talk about it. Um, but he, he's got 10 photographs of the ship circling this tree at this location called Fusbuhl. And you've got to ask yourself, how can he only have 10 pictures? When he goes to a, 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 what he calls a contact and these ships appear, he usually runs through several rolls of film. And the, the, the smallest amount of photographs you can take on a roll of film is 24 exposure. So if he's only got 10 photographs to show us from that session, did he really only take 10 photographs? Or did he take the whole film? And he's only showing us the ones that worked. You see, right. so any photograph that doesn't work. What, what method did he use? Um, Cal Korf covered that particular location um, and discovered that Maya had to have moved the tree to take some of the photographs and then the other ones. So it, it can't be a genuine tree planted in the ground. And if you look at the photographs, if you look at every single one of the 10 pictures, Ask yourself, why can I never see the base of this tree? <laughs> and my reasoning as to why you can't see the base of the tree is because it's sitting in a pot. <laughs> and he doesn't, a- want you, he doesn't want you to see the pot. And it's a, tree, it's a small tree that he can carry around in the pot. So you'll never see the base of it on purpose. 
You see? Right. And uh, yeah, and then with the force perspective, he can get whatever, you know, those those uh yeah. 14 those 14 extra pictures that weren't there were probably practice shots or run-ups or yeah, the stuff that didn't work. Well, I, I get what you mean. To, to be honest, um I think he suspended the model in those shots. Because that's the easiest way to do them. If you're going to try and um, use a mechanical arm, like I've suggested in my film, there's a possibility. You, you could do that, you know, but it, it, it's much easier just to suspend it. it. It's very, very quick and easy to do something like that. So, uh, and this adds to the hypothesis that um, he of why he only took ten pictures. Um, the other fourteen pictures didn't work because the line will have showed up. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you that, know, that, and, that's and, exactly that's exactly the reason, in my opinion, uh, as to why at the the later location called Hassenbol, um, he says he took about a hundred pictures. That's about three or four rolls of film, and yet uh, no one on this planet has ever seen any more than about thirty-one or thirty-two pictures from that session. And I discovered by taking photographs uh, with models on fishing line that um, that's exactly the percentage number of the photographs that don't work. So if I take 100 pictures of a model UFO with some fishing line, about 70 of them will have a, at least a little bit of the line showing at some point in the frame. So those are unusable. So you're never going to show them to anyone. And all you have to do is say, oh, I lost them, or oh, all these people stole them. What can I do? You know, it's just an excuse to, to cover okay. the fact that some of these pictures don't work. So some of these Figu people, they literally, uh, this just sound. you know, when I said that, you know, it was reckless and, and could be dangerous, that just like send alarm bells ringing off in my head. They send children to that place all alone, unsupervised. Just here, go have go go learn from Edward Meyer and or Billy Meyer, yeah. and uh, he'll he'll teach you yeah, a yeah. spiritual message. Oh yeah, no, it, it it seems to be there's all sorts of people going through that place of all ages. You know, there's no there's wow. no control over it. There's there's no authority looking looking at what's going on, saying hey you. That little girl can't go down there because her parents have sent her. Who's going to say that? Her parents have sent her their, their daughter. And if Who's they're sending, say, who, who can stop that? And if they're sending their child, well, that means they buy this hook, line, and sinker, and shit. Billy's a messiah, right? I mean, exactly, absolutely. Wow, that's that's uh, that's it, intense. It's far, it's far it's far out, isn't it? That he that he actually gets away with this. Well, where is the authority that can control what's going on or look over it and say, hey, this has gone too far? There, there is no authority to do that. The only people who are having a go at this case are me, Cal Corf, Derek Bartholomew, and Anthony Wharton. There's only four of us, and out of all of us, Cal Corf is the one who's the journalist. He's got the most authority. Well, and, and there was a huge... Right, that, that's they assassinated what I was gonna... his character. Because yes. he's got the most authority, they assassinated his character. Yeah, could you go into detail on that? I knew there was a huge stink or blow up. Uh, you can't <laughs> you can't really look at the Billy Meyer case without uh, Carl Korf's name coming up. And a lot of it, uh, I didn't quite understand where all the controversy on both sides was coming from. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, um it's very simple. Cal Korf did a really good job. That's what happened. He did such a good job, they had to assassinate his character because there's nothing else they can do. It's as simple as that. You know, um, there, there's a, a controversial issue concerning the wedding cake uh, that Cal briefly covered in his book where he um, suggests that the wedding cake in the tree was suspended but he didn't know. He was just guessing. And if, you know, if he's put a line in there to show that it's suspended, what he's doing is saying, this is what I think is happening. That's all he's doing. But, of course, they blow it well out of proportion. You know? well, they and, said and, he was... Um, they they, they with... pretend that he's fabricating stuff. when it, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. He went into it with the same attitude that I did. You know, let's test this thing. If it's genuine, fantastic. I'll accept that it's genuine. But if it's not, I will tell everyone that it's not. 
What is up with that audio? Now I know that you sent me a picture to look at the uh, uh, to, to look at the uh, the waveforms that match up eventually. Uh, can you please explain that in the detail that we haven't been able to go over before? Yeah, uh, those are the beam chip sounds. Um, I had absolutely no intention of finding beam chip sounds or the source of beam chip sounds. Uh, it didn't even cross my mind, you know, because. So many people over the years have suggested it's a synthesizer or a bunch of synth synthesizers or whatever, um, and no one's come up with the actual sound. So um, it, it just didn't cross my mind. And uh, the very first day I went out into the field behind where I live and um, suspended horizontally three UFO models because I wanted to get on with the uh, the Bactyl Hornley photographs, the, the photographs where he has three ships in the frame. I was I was doing that. I was testing to see how how I could do that, and um, all three ships were on the line. I actually went out at half past four in the morning because I was doing some um, sunrise shots, um, and I had to be there before the sun came up. So after I did those, I was I was just sitting down. I, I put my three ships up, you know, they're up there. I'm, I'm I'm preparing to take some photographs of them and some films. And I'm sitting there playing with my cameras. And all of a sudden, this sound comes from nowhere. Uh, and it, it, I, within, within about one second, I, I instantly recognized that these were uh, the beam ship sounds. And I just couldn't believe it. You know, the, my models were producing this sound. And... Of course, in a flash, it suddenly occurred to me that this is how he did it. This is where his sounds come from. Um, I'm saying he used UFO models. And lo and behold, the beamship sounds are coming from UFO models. Now, you know, what are the chances of that happening? This proves that, that um, this shows that what people should have done in the past, way back in the late 70s, people like Wendell Stevens, this is what they should have done. And they didn't. Um, so I'm, the, you know, for the first time ever, it, um, we know what the beam ship sounds are, where they're from, how they're produced, and it's nothing more than acoustical resonance. What you've got with a fishing line tied between two trees and a suspended um, UFO model is the equivalent of a guitar, you know, uh, with one string. <clears throat> so um, the, the wind uh, vibrates this string. And those vibrations go into the model, which is two uh, plates opposite each other, exactly like two speaker cones. And they vibrate in sympathy with the line. And because they're shaped like speaker cones, they create this sound. And that's all it is. It's really, really simple. Um, I recorded them. I sent my beam chip sounds to a guy called James Moore, who said he would analyze them. And I trusted him. And he was using um, Soundbooth CS4, which is an Adobe program. So when I got them back from him, I realized that they, they showed me a, um, a graph of Billy Myers beam chip sounds. And they showed uh, a graph of the six beam chip sounds that I sent them. And um, I had to normalize what um, he had done to mine because the Billy Myers sounds were being shown up to a value of 10 kilohertz. But my beamship sounds, they had cut off and blanked above four kilohertz. So you could only see the bottom portion of my sounds on, on, the, on the display. Um, even though I don't have the upper portion of my sounds, when I analyzed, uh, the, when I compared mine with his, it turned out that the main sound is between one and two kilohertz in both cases. In other words, my main sounds have the same frequencies as his main sounds. And the, the other characteristic that was um, exactly the same was the fact that above that, that signature, between one and two kilohertz, you have repeating um, shapes, almost like a fractal looking thing. And, and that's what I got, and that's what he got. So as far as I'm concerned, I found his sounds, and it is proved, because the characteristic on these, these graphs is precisely the same. Yeah, well, what are the odds that you can put three of his ships or mo the models you created off of the image and they make the same sound? I mean, that's just remarkable. And I could just see Billy out there doing it and he hears the sound and goes, hey, I could use that too. 
I mean, exactly. Uh, That's yeah. exactly what he would have done. Yeah, yeah. And it, he, he might have even known about it before. Um, if you listen to his sounds, you can see he knows what he's doing. He's obviously set up um, these types of objects. You, by the way, you're not supposed to glue the plates together. If you want them to make lots of loud sounds, like the beam chip sounds, if you glue them together, you're going to dampen those sounds, and it's going to kill it. So you, you can't glue those kind of models together. And it just so happened that the, small, the two smaller models I was using that morning were not glued together. So in a way, I got lucky that I didn't do that. You know, because it wouldn't have happened like that otherwise had I glued them together. Now, if so you wouldn't have a bit of luck there. Well, if you wouldn't have glued glued them together, would you still have investigated the sounds, or was that just completely by coincidence and happenstance that it happened? Um, well, the the larger model that morning made exactly the same sounds, but it was very very uh, faint because the the entire model was glued together and really tightly wired together as well. So you're not allowing the the plates to really vibrate as they 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 could do. You know, so uh, I, now, I was getting it from the model, so I would have got them anyway, and I would have found out and 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 done the right thing in the end anyway. Now, some of those photos, the early ones that Billy has done from, say, India, like the uh, the cross in the sky and some of the looks yeah, like yeah. it looks like light beans in the sky or something, jumping beans or something. Um, could you tell us how those may have been done? <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, when you say jumping beans, it's a it's a photograph taken in India where in the bottom of the frame there's a young lady. Um, Michael Horn has uh, previously stated that the young lady is looking up into the sky when she's not. She's actually facing the camera, so she has no idea there's anything going on at all. Of course, there isn't. Um, in the sky, it, it looks to me like a double exposure. Straight away, I recognize that as a double exposure because I've actually done double exposures, and um, I replicated that particular photograph um, type. So all I did was, um, at night, I, I stepped out my front door, I took pictures of the street lights, uh, and then I um, took the, the, the camera back in, in the pitch black, and I, I took the, the film out after taking about 10 pictures of street lights, and I wound it back up, and I loaded it back in the camera, and then the following day, during the day, I took daytime pictures looking up into the sky with houses in the bottom of the frame. And, you know, of course, um, they, they mix together and you end up with what looks like lights in the sky. And some of the lights, even though they're spherical or circular, they actually registered exactly like the registrations in that picture that Billy Meyer took. So I have no problem with thinking that that's a double exposure photograph. Um, the other photograph you mentioned is the one with the cross in the sky. And... Um, I thought before, that's probably just a double exposure as well. But uh, when I heard Alexandra Rojas on his show, Open Minds TV, he discussed that photograph and he said, and I think he's right, he said that he reckoned Billy Meyer could easily have put two bits of sellotape on the frame before exposing it and then peeled them off. Um, I, I, I haven't tried that myself, but that sounds like, the kind of thing that Billy Meyer would do. Uh, if you look at the cross in the sky on that photograph, um, you can see it, it's not a, it's not uh, entirely um, as you'd expect it to be if it was a solid object or a proper looking cross. If you look at the edges, they look a bit rough and they do make me think of sellotape. So those would be my two explanations for those two photographs. Right, I could I could definitely definitely uh see that as a as a very strong possibility the 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 tape. Uh there's another photo that it shows a uh I'm going to get this wrong. I I said it wrong when I asked Michael about it as well. The fire ship that looks like fire is is all around and it's actually like a firework or something. I asked Michael about this. Uh have you seen that photo? I know the photo very very well indeed, man. Uh, you know, years ago, um, when I first saw the case, before I saw his films, I saw Contact from the Pleiades, and that fire ship, so-called, is one of the main pictures in the video where they suggest that um, people other than Billy Meyer have taken pictures of these, you know, UFOs. 
and that impressed me at the time. <clears throat> um, I never had an explanation for that, um, even in 2009, but when I saw the IIG website, they had an explanation for that, and their explanation is absolutely adequate and um, uh, sufficient. So what they say he's doing is he's got a, a, the equivalent of a skipping rope. He's holding one end of it and he's swinging the rope around like a, a cowboy doing a lasso around the top of his head. And at the end of the rope, he's got a piece of um, steel wool that he's set alight. So he, he's, fl he's flinging a, st a, a lit steel wool ball around his head and the signature that it leaves on the camera, on the photograph, is exactly what we see in his photographs. And um, when, when all these the so-called witnesses who, who are supposed to be seeing these UFOs for themselves, uh, when, they, when they see these supposed UFOs, it's always at night, and Billy Meyer is never with them. It's like Superman, you know? Uh, Clark Kent is never there when Superman's around, you know? Because he's, right. he's Superman. So here's Billy Meyer. He's, he's off in the distance in the pitch dark, because this is the countryside. There's no street lights as such, lighting everything up. It is really dark. Um, so he's up in the hills, uh, off in the distance. They're all waiting for a demonstration. He fires up his steel wool ball, flings it round his head, and they think there's a UFO in the distance doing some demonstration. But it's just him. And, and that's all there is to it. And IIG, their photograph, um, they were challenged to uh, produce uh, a photograph of the fire ship type where the person spinning the thing around their head had their hand absolutely still in the frame. And they managed to do that with a digital shot. They, did, they didn't um, uh, make the exposure um, really short, so they made sure the guy's hand wasn't moving. They just took a normal picture. And the guy's hand looks like it's dead stationary, exactly like Billy Meyer's second photograph of the fire ship, where he's supposed to be standing underneath it, uh, holding a microphone up towards it. But of course, what he's holding in his hand is a thing that's spinning the steel wool around. Yes. Uh, ha have you seen any of the pictures of the telemeter discs? Have you heard of that word before, the telemeter? I think I'm saying it right. I'm probably not. <laughs> yeah. I, I I, I, I keep hearing Michael Horn say, and then a telemeter disc moves over to the side, and he took this photo. What, what is a telemeter disc? Uh, a telemeter disc looks like an egg. Uh, it's it's light. Uh, it's basically a UFO, or what you would consider a uh, a UFO probe to be. Um, it's not actually a ship people are in. Uh, well, unless Billy says they can shrink down and then get larger. I mean, who knows? But... um. Uh, basically, it's a yeah. telemetry disc, and, and it, it goes around, and it, it scans and reports back information, whatever the Pleiarans or the uh, the Pleiadians uh, want. <laughs> I see. I, I, are you referring to, by any chance, the things they call the energy ships? Or um, in the set of photographs that he takes where you've got energy ships and li or strange lights in the near distance, there's one uh, where the light is kind of spherical. Um, is that what you're talking about? Because I don't yeah, know one, what you're referring to otherwise. Yeah, one picture of his house. Uh, he took a picture of his house, and uh, in the back corner by the garage, it, they say it's a telemetry disc, but what it actually looks like to me, and I'm not a photographer, I have no uh, credibility in the photography field or anything, but to me it looks like sun reflection or a light reflection or some source that is being lit up by the sun. Um and that's my opinion. But these telemeter discs are supposed to be about the shape of an egg, kind of, and they're thin, and uh, they're supposed to report back information. Um, and, you know, as uh, as Michael would say, that's what the evidence of the case says. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I'm not too sure about that, um, to be honest. There is so much stuff in this case. No one person can cover all that. It's just too much because it, it, it's it, done on purpose, you know. It's to make sure that they can they can always have the excuse that if you debunk this thing over here, they've got something over there to confound you. And because you haven't debunked that thing over there, you're wrong. You know, right. This, and, this is what they do. Yeah, and Michael also says is just because you didn't do the research doesn't make the research that has previously been done garbage. 
Uh, but that's right. kind of a red that's kind of a red herring also. I mean, any scientist would recreate anything in their lab to confirm or deny that they could do it, you know? Uh, that's right, that's right. It, yeah, so that's a red herring. And something else I asked Michael was that, you know, I said, uh, uh, Billy Meyer, what separates Billy Meyer from, say, a character like Joseph Smith? And he completely rejected my thought because of the religious aspect of Joseph Smith. I believe Joseph Smith to be a huge fraud. Uh, anybody that says that they believe in God, but yet they tell you what's right, and they're going to be on the right hand of God judging you at the end, that's insane, along with a lot of other religions. But my point was is that Billy Meyer was told by the ETs, just as Joseph Smith was told by uh, angels, to go dig something up and decipher it. And what would be deciphered would be the new word or the new gospel or, uh, you know, um, a new spiritual age, so to speak. The same thing Billy Meyer did with the uh, Emmanu uh, the uh, Talmud Emmanuel. And then, uh, basically, this is my thought. I think that Billy Meyer is almost an amalgam of, say, a George Adamski and Joseph Smith. What would your opinion on that be? And my thought. Yeah, I, I said that. That's very, very. Um, that's very, very good. Uh, he he knew about George Adamski, that's for sure. And uh, apparently, he was a bit of a fan. So um, Billy Meyer's case has all the hallmarks of George Adamski's case. It's got everything exactly the same. Aliens with higher wisdom. You know the context. The uh, the fact that no one else can see these things. I, I know some other people have said they've seen George Adamski type ships. Um, I can't deny or confirm that. It's got nothing to do with me. Um, but you're mm -hmm. right in saying that um, his case is very, very similar to George Adamski's. Uh, this, this Smith guy, I, I'm really unfamiliar with this guy completely. Uh, maybe it's an Americanism, I don't know, but I, I've never heard of him. No, it's uh, religion. You've got, uh, you've got, you know, you got your Baptists, your Christians, your, you know, you got all these different denominations. Well, the Book of Mormon oh, yeah. was written. The Book of Mormon was written by Joseph Smith. Now, this might, I you know, see, I see. yes, yes. So you might get a little bit of an insight on on this. So basically, Joseph Smith got uh, visited by angels, which some people would consider ETs to be angels. But anyway, angels come down and tell him, "Hey, dig here. You'll find a silver and a gold tablet. On these tablets, we're going to give you a seeing stone. With these seeing, with this seeing stone, it will decipher this language into English." that you do not know the, the language. It'll decipher it for you. And it was all hidden. Only he could decipher it. Only he saw the stone. Only he saw the tablets. A guy helped him translate. He, you know, he would, uh, they'd talk through a door or something, and he would decipher the tablet while somebody would write it down. Well, he went to his wife and said, hey, uh, Joseph Smith, angels, you know, God, this is the new word. This is the new vision. And his wife said, well, hey, maybe he's a huckster. Maybe he's a fraud. Why don't you throw those that manuscript away, tell him you lost it, and he needs to rewrite it. If it matches up exactly, then we know he's telling the truth. Well, the Mormon church uses this as a, it's proven, but it, it's, a, it's a red herring. Basically, he went back to Joseph Smith and said, uh, I've lost the, transcri the transcription. We have to do it again. Well, Joseph Smith gets all pissed off. He's upset. He prays for three days, and he comes back, and he says, okay, the gold tablet is out. The angels took it back. God, God said that I can only transcribe off of the silver tablet now. And that is their proof that, you know, not, not that he was a fraud, but that God took the tablet back and he had to decipher off the other one. That's where the Book of Mormon comes into play. And it's, okay, just, I got that. it's just very similar, finding something, having to decipher it and, you know, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that sounds like the, the discovery of the Talmud of Emmanuel, supposedly. I think that's the manuscript that Maya says he found. Um, yes, which was... I, I, don't really, I, I was just going to say, I, I don't really know much about that. Um, Billy Meyer's philosophy, I mean, we could talk all night about that. We could go into metaphysics, if you like, but... Um, um, well, let me know, ask you this. That's not really my thing with him. Let me ask you this. Um... I, I would really appreciate uh, your your vision on this or your thoughts on this. Um, in our, our universe, um, there's a lot of things that many people scoff at and say is not real. What is your beliefs on, say, UFOs 
or uh, since you're, you know, you, uh, you're a mathematician, what is your outlook on other civilizations possibly visiting here and uh, what maybe the larger reality possibly is? What is your thoughts? Um, I, I could spend all night talking about that, dude. <laughs> you know, I really could. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll give you a brief, okay? Um, okay. I, we're not alone. The, the, there's absolutely no doubt that we are not alone in the universe or, the, or even this galaxy. There's going to be civilization absolutely everywhere. Everywhere. Um, the only issue is how to get here, how to travel. Um, I think there's enough potential evidence to suggest that the human race on Earth has been watched for a very, very long time. And the, the ideal station to watch us from is the moon. You see, um, there, are, there, are, there are lots and lots of issues with NASA photography from the moon um, that, that uh, strongly suggest that the moon is actually inhabited and the people that are inhabiting it, I say people, I don't know who they are, but they are watching us. And I think they're watching us because we are warmongers. Yes. You see, they, if, if they know we're warmongers and they're keeping an eye on us, I don't think they want us to export this warmongering attitude. So um, I think that we are considered dangerous in, in this environmental part of the galaxy, I think that we are considered dangerous, and that's why we're being watched. Yes, well, I believe that. I believe there's an ebb and flow. I believe that civilizations has rise and and fell so many so many times. Technology has been lost. Information has been lost. Uh, I believe that our moon is inhabited uh, by what I couldn't tell you. Uh, I believe that these ships have been visiting us for a long time, watching us, monitoring us. Uh, maybe pulling strings, I don't know. Uh, what's inside the ships, I don't know. But I can say this, in my perspective, we live in a biological, sociological zoo. And our zookeepers buzz yes. in from time to time to make sure the monkeys aren't mauling the bears and they get the hell back out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. I like that, yeah. I agree. Yeah, well, <laughs> I agree. you know... I mean, it wasn't that long ago we supposedly, if scientific, you know, uh, theories are correct, that, you know, we descended out of the trees and onto the plains. Well, it wasn't really that long ago. I mean, we're uh, we're we're in our infancy. And if there's a civilization out there that's, you know, say, uh, you know, uh, um, they have types of civilizations. If civilization can harness the power of a of a galaxy or a star, I would say they could get here no problem. Uh, but what would they think when they did get here, I guess, is the question. And a lot of people would really like to be uh, in contact with an ET or would love a, an experience like that. I could I could tell you firsthand, or not firsthand, but I could tell you that, you know, if I saw a UFO in the sky, shiny lights in the whole nine, and it, and it just looked so awesome, as soon as it landed, I'd shit my pants. I would run and hide. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what is yeah, what is going to come through that door? You don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I think that scares a lot of people, which is the unknown, which is why a lot of people fear death. And any any time there's an unknown, either the Billy Meyer story or other, there's always going to be, you know, or death, religion, whatever. There's always going to be hucksters that are going to try to suck you in and manipulate your opinion, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say um, that there is a tradition um, on this planet um it's essentially called hermetic or hermeticism, and um, it, it strongly suggests. Um, oh, what was I going to say? It, it, it strongly suggests that it, it is possible um, for us because it, it's only in the West that people say it's impossible to know the meaning of life. You know, um, this idea of being scared and uh, of unknown things. If the universe was known to you, if you understood it. Would you be frightened anymore? Maybe these people who are watching us, if there are such things, or the other people out there, you know, um, maybe it's our fear of the unknown that's making us dangerous. 
And that, that, that leads me to suspect that um, human beings have been controlled and there's been an attempt to control the way people think in general. You know, uh, there's, there's a terrible lack of enlightenment on this planet. Um, I, I think the information is available, not through Billy Meyer, because he, he just glues stuff together the way he wants to. You know, he talks about black holes, and I can, I can blow black holes out of the water. As far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as a black hole. Um, uh, so I, I think it's possible to know the meaning of life, and it really it's only in the West that people laugh and scoff at the idea that somebody could know such a thing, because um, scientists tell us that they don't know how the universe works. They think they do. You know, they, they want to, and they're, they're trying to work out how it how it started, what came before it, all this sort of thing. But I, I tell you, there is a tradition. It's called Hermeticism, and it explains the universe, and it does it adequately. So as a mathematician, I've studied Kabbalah. Um, I've studied Kabbalah for more than 20 years, and I, I can tell you, I think it's the absolute truth. Not that it's because it's Jewish, it's got nothing to do with who, you know, who owns Kabbalah. Nobody owns Kabbalah. It, it's just a subject that everyone can study. And it, it, it's exactly like um, Sufism. It's exactly like um, Hinduism. But Hinduism is more of a veiled version of it. Um, you know, you, you'd need to know Hinduism really to understand how they compare. But they're, they're exactly the same. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. It's just a different cultural um, expression. Um, I, I think Kabbalah comes from Ireland, personally, from the ancient world, in, uh, from the Druids. I think the Druids came up with Kabbalah. I don't think it's Jewish at all. I think the Jews, being very intelligent people on earth, recognized that it was an extremely intelligent thing, and they, they took it on for themselves because they liked it. Um, that's really what I think. And, and in, this, in these subjects, you will find these answers. Uh, you'll find the meaning of life. You'll, you will understand it from their point of view. But, you know, we, in this day and age, we have to combat this, this idea that our scientists, our physicists, are the people that we should be listening to. I don't think they are, because I've been through university. I, I've been with these people. I know how they think. I learned their, their ways, their means. Um, most of my third year was spent guessing. I did a course called Stellar Structure. I expected to be learning about how stars work. And the first thing my lecturer said was, I'm really sorry, guys, but nobody, none of us know how a star works. So we're going to you know, show you how we try to model them. So you know, they're, 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 they're clutching at straws when it comes to astrophysics. Um, yes, I would say no... no 95% of astrophysics is guesswork, and it's yeah, just theory. Yeah, and they're, they're ever-changing models as well, even the universe one. It's, it's, it's always changing with a new hypothesis or a new theory, correct? Yeah, oh, my goodness me. All the time, all the time. It's always developing, so they never seem to get anywhere. Yeah. You know, they well, take they... another, another step up the ladder, but they never get to the top, it seems. Um, I, I just want to say, if anyone's listening, because I mentioned the meaning of life and maybe people can get it, I'm sure there's some people who are listening either now or in the future who are going to say, you know, come on, give me something to go on. I want to know the meaning of life. I'll tell you, read uh, a guy called Walter Russell. Uh, look at Kabbalah. Look at Hinduism. Um, if you want to look at Billy Meyer stuff, be my guest. I couldn't care less what you. If you want to look at, if you believe him or not, it doesn't matter to me. You know, he. he I, know, I know he doesn't have the whole truth because he mixes things together and he's full of contradictions. Only the real truth will never contradict itself. You know, so yeah. um, I really believe that this this guy in the 20th century who was lambasted in the 1920s by physicists because he tried to explain to them how the universe works because it came to him in inspirational form. I think there are two ways of acquiring knowledge. The, the one way, the, the scientific way, the plodding, methodical way, it's very useful, it's very good, um, but even they make mistakes. Um, and it's very, very slow. It's a very slow process. You'll never get there in one lifetime. It takes centuries. But it seems, by analyzing for a long time this material called Kabbalah and um, you know, the work of Walter Russell, 
that absolutely matches perfectly. I think these people and these sources have got it personally. I really do um, because it, it just makes perfect sense to me, especially right. Walter Russell, especially Walter Russell. He, he was spot on in my opinion, but that's just my opinion at the end of the day, you know, take it or leave it. So right but, on. Yeah. Well, uh, Philip, we, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, I, I also really appreciate you giving me or giving us, giving the viewer or the listeners and, uh, and myself, uh, the information on what you truly believe may be going on. Cause some skeptics or some debunkers of this or that, you know, they, they, they think it's all, uh, horse, horse crap. And it's, it, you know, some of it may be, so, you know, it's all in the, in the eye of the experiencer. And that is absolutely true. Something else you said that, uh, makes complete sense is that we, we do have a lack of, uh, of spiritual evolution here on planet earth. I mean, uh, we do have the biggest propaganda tool ever that has ever been on this planet, which is called TV that we all park our butts in front of for six hours a day, getting bombarded with uh, getting bombarded with buy, 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 consume, consume, consume. And by the way, throw it away and buy a new one because it's cheaper than fixing what you got. Uh, yeah. we can't, we cannot sustain this type of civilization in my mind, uh, too much longer. And that could be 200 years, but I mean, that's a frack, a blink of an eye in time. But, uh, I think we're headed into trouble. Would you agree? I, I would. I, I actually think the biggest problem on this planet right now is in fact the economic system and the concept of money. That's what's causing all the problems, in my opinion, and that's the only thing that's ever caused problems. It's making you know, us slaves. Everything revolves around it. Everything yeah. revolves around it. People's beliefs, you know, that somebody who wants other people to believe what he's saying is because he wants to make money out of them. So it's all about just money. So it's got yeah. nothing to do with wanting enlightenment. You know, it's just about wanting money. So it's all, money is the problem. That's what I say. I, yeah, I can't well, stand it, money. I, I hate it. I think it should. I don't think it should exist. We should have a completely different system. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in school, you know, uh, this is something else that I, I run into quite a bit. The things I was taught in school are not true, or it's a partial truth, or a individual truth. Like this is how America sees it, but it's not true. Yeah. Okay, uh, our independence when we you know, decided to not uh, pay taxes. They tell us in school that the uh, the Boston Tea Party was because we did not want to pay taxes. That is a falsehood. Right. We would have paid yeah. taxes. They would not accept our American currency. They wanted gold and silver. They didn't want I our see. paper money. So yeah. we revolted because of that. If 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 the king would have said, give us your currency, fine, whatever, we would still be part of Europe. I truly believe that because yeah. we, we didn't have a problem with, you know, paying our taxes. But, you know, history is written by the winners, so to speak. Uh, yeah. You don't hear That's from right. the losers. You don't hear from the losers and you don't hear their side of things. I mean, uh, when they teach you about Vietnam in school, they do not mention the Gulf of Tonkin incident. If they do, they mention it as fact. I can't. Mm. I, I, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but it's a red herring. Supposedly, two Vietnamese torpedo boats went out and attacked a destroyer, and that is why we committed ground troops and our soldiers into Vietnam for the police action, uh, and many of our people died. But come to find out, that destroyer was never attacked. It was just to get the American people excited enough to where we'd go back to sleep and let the let the government do what it wanted. Yeah, pro- the propaganda machine, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's well, typ- we that, that's just typical, man. Yeah. Well, we have 10 minutes left. Uh I would like you to say anything you'd like and to also uh uh plug your websites and uh your YouTube videos and all that. Plug plug plug, my friend. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, well, the, uh, all the stuff I did is available to look at on Derek Bartholomew's website called BillyMeyerUFOCase.com, all in one word. Um, I, I did a website called BillyMeyerUFO.com, 
um, where I show things from my point of view because um, Derek had um, you know his own thing going on and I did this stuff for him in a way um, so he used all my stuff so that's absolutely no problem it's great um, but I, I don't have any say on that website so I did my own website um, apart from that I've got a YouTube channel uh, which is simply under my name which is Phil Langdon um, just to let people know, it used to be called Mr. Morlam One uh, because I opened the channel initially to collect uh, music from Thailand, and a style of music from Thailand is called Molam. Um, so Mr. Morlam One is simply, you know, I'm a foreigner who shouldn't be listening to Thai music, but I like it, so I do. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, I used to work in Thailand. Though. Um, so. Uh, yeah, those, those are the three websites. My my YouTube channel. Uh, the if you go, just Google a uh, UFO bust, um, that's the series I put up um, covering the Billy Meyer stuff. There are nine episodes, um, and that's about it on that. But I actually did want to raise one issue um, today before we go, and that is um, the fact that the uh, the Billy Meyer photographs um, that there is in fact proof that uh, Billy Meyer took photographs of models in his own photographs. And it's specifically uh, at a place called Hassenbol. He took three sunset shots. The, the, one of those shots clearly shows um, that the tree the object seems to be behind is in fact uh, behind the object. So the branches of this tree go behind the object in the frame, uh, even though Billy Meyer says the object is behind the tree. So uh, we know that he's not telling us the truth there because his own photograph says that he's not telling the truth. Um, anyone can check that, and you can see the uh, analysis of that picture in episode seven of the UFO bus series. Uh, the other issue, um, there is proof also that he used models at the location called Berg uh because there's a white stripe reflection on the base of his UFO in every single photograph at that location and the only explanation for that is that there's a white path on the ground right in front of him. Um, he says the object is um, quite a distance away over the field, uh, but in fact the, the, the white stripe reflection proves that it's directly above this white path that's directly in front of him. So it has to be a model suspended right in front of him. So there, right there is proof in his own pictures that he faked it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say uh, was... Um, that this guy, Raul Zahi, has recently written three papers, one on the wedding cake and the reflections in the spheres on the wedding cake. The other paper he did was a supposed analysis on the pendulum film. Um, and the final one he's done is about the energy ships. They're all full of um, problems, mistakes, assumptions, and uh, conclusions that cannot be drawn. So um, do I have time to read a single paragraph from his pendulum film analysis, just to give you an uh, example? Yes, you absolutely do. And uh, when you're done with that, uh, we have six minutes for you to read the paragraph. And then if it's not too racy, tell us the most exciting thing you did in Thailand. Go ahead. Oh, oh, uh, the reason I was there, I played drums. I played drums since I was 18. Um, I was actually offered a job when I was there, and I took it because um, I had the time and I had the means. So I did that for a year. I played the drums in a Thai band for a year um, just to have the experience and to have a, a sort of different experience in life because uh, living in London can be a little boring. <laughs> right? So well, just an you're exciting a, point in my life. Say, say you're a math ma mathematician with some soul. I like it. <laughs> Go ahead and read the paragraph. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I love jazz and fusion <laughs> music. Excellent. Okay, so um, let me just give you a very, very quick um, idea of what's wrong with uh, Raul Zahi's um, supposed analysis, if it works. Yeah, here we go. Um, if anyone goes to theyfly.com, they can see this. It's a top right. You click on the top right-hand side. It says corroboration and evidence on the front page of They Fly. And you'll be taken to a page that shows you uh, links to Raul Zahi's papers. Uh, and Raul Zahi says the following on page four. He says, Phil Langdon, that's me, made a very good simulation 
by constructing a model showing how it can approximate Meyer's film. However, he did not conduct an analysis of the physical aspects as Bruce Maccabee did, and he ignored a few important details. What details are these, Raoul? I'm asking myself. He doesn't say. He goes on and says, in addition, without describing what these details are, Maccabee did not, as far as I know, conduct a practical test to determine how easy or difficult it is to create this dancing UFO simulation. Therefore, neither the Langdon nor the Maccabee investigations offered good explanations as to how the model hypothesis can be consistent with the variation in the object's movements to different time periods. He's referring to the fact that when you, um, in Meyer's film, he reckons the height of the object is changing all the time, as well as the left, you know, the bobbing around and the penduluming about. And the reason for the timing change, and that it is bobbing up and down as well, is because it's suspended from a tree branch at the flimsy end of a tree branch whose motions have randomness in them. And randomness cannot be reproduced. Okay, so if someone says, hey, at, at 33 seconds in your pendulum film, you do something slightly different to Myers, who cares? It, there, there's, there's an element of randomness in that particular film. And he, this guy, Rolzar, he's not accounting for that. He hasn't even mentioned it. There's all sorts of things wrong with these papers that he's put up. And this particular one reads to me like a 15-year-old wrote it in school for a project. It's that bad. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, Philip, we're about out of time. Uh, I wanted yeah. to I wanted to touch on something. Uh, Michael has agreed to come back and do uh, a show with yourself, me, and my co-host if he's available on that night. And uh, yeah. I wanted I wanted to ask you if uh, you you would come back and entertain that idea. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's going to be very interesting, very interesting indeed, because Michael Horn's got an excuse for everything. Well, it would be good to hear those excuses, and uh, I mentioned him a few times yeah. in this episode, and, and whatever we said tonight, he'll definitely get a chance to respond to, absolutely, and uh, it's all done in good fun and good heart and everything, and uh, yeah, I, sure, I want to... Sure. I, I, I want to thank you, Philip, for all the uh, due diligence that you did in recreating some of these photos. And uh, I, like I said, I wanted to thank you again for coming on the show and thank you uh, for sharing your personal uh, thoughts and beliefs with us. And we really appreciate that tonight. Dude, it's been, it's been great fun. Thank you so much for having me on. It's nothing but a pleasure. And doing this stuff was nothing but pleasure. It's great fun. Okay. A so I've, I've had nothing but fun. Excellent. And, you know, uh, you've been a great guest. Uh, I'd love to have you on again, and we could just talk about anything. It doesn't even have to be about Billy Meyer. Exactly. I I'd love to do metaphysics or, or UFOs in general or aliens. We, we could do that any time, dude. I I've got so much stuff to talk about there. You know, I've, I've been at it for 20, 25 years. So oh, that would wow. be fantastic if it ever comes up. Absolutely. We will definitely do this again. Okay, uh, okay. our guest tonight on Disclosure Now has been uh, Philip Langdon, a Billy Meyer debunker. Now we're going to head over for 10 minutes of the EEN, Evolution Enlightenment Network's upcoming events. Here we go. Hi, this is Karen Newman from the show About Oneness. And here's what's coming up on the Enlightenment Evolution Network 1 and 2, starting on Monday, November the 24th, until Sunday, November the 30th. Simply put, Rob Gauthier, founder of the EEN and the host of the show that started it all, the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, has put together the greatest metaphysical radio network ever. Seven days a week, we have shows that will aid you on your path to enlightenment, evolution, and ascension. On EEN1, on Mondays, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, is Heart to Heart Talk Radio with your host, Daniel Scranton. Join Daniel and his featured guests discussing a wide variety of metaphysical topics. Daniel channels the Creators, the Hathors, Ophelia the Fairy, and Archangel Michael, and the latest, the Unicorn Collective. Daniel and his guests will take phone calls and questions, and it's sure to generate high-frequency discussions. You can find more about Daniel at his website, danielscranton.com, and also on Facebook. Go to the Events tab on Daniel's website to learn more about Daniel's upcoming events. 
Daniel's guest on the 17th of November is his lovely wife, Lana Boss, where they will be discussing the importance of living where you want to live. And then on the 24th of November, Susan Fittner, author of From Your Vision Board to Your Bedroom, will be Daniel's guest. On Tuesday at noon, also 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, please join hosts Megan Crandallmeyer and Rachel Archelaus for Radio Inspiration, Expression, and Abundance for their show, Soulfulpreneur. Spiritual business specialists Rachel and Megan will bring you inspiring conversations with people who are living their soul purpose. Frequent guests include psychic mediums, channelers, coaches, artists, and authors. They end every show with psychic readings and business coaching. Your questions about your spiritual business or life purpose journey are welcome. On the 24th of November, Rachel and Megan's guest is Robert Scheinfeld, author of Busting Loose from the Money Game. Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, is the show that started it all, the Enlightenment Evolution Hour with host Rob Gautier. Rob channels Treb on the first Wednesday of each month and will take callers' questions. On the third Wednesday, we'll have special guests such as guest channelers and other metaphysical teachers. The other two Wednesdays are freestyle call-in shows to discuss whatever callers have on their minds. Tune in to Rob on Wednesday nights, and you can also find him at TrebChanneling.com and on Facebook at the Enlightenment Evolution Network group page. Rob's guest on the 28th of November will be Lee Harris. If you are interested in the CE5 Day Channeling Workshop in Asheville, North Carolina, go to TrebChanneling.com where you can find more details on how to register. Starting on Sundays from September 14th, TrebChanneling.com offers hour-long meditation classes. Please go to TrebChanneling.com to register. Another project near and dear to Rob's heart is the much-anticipated sequel to the groundbreaking film Tuning In called Tuning In Now. The movie will feature channelers such as Daryl Anka and Bashar, Lee Carroll and Cryon, and our very own Rob Gottier and Treb. Tuning in now, we explore the amazing work of today's top channels and how they are helping to awaken the consciousness of the planet. This film is in fundraising stages at the moment, and with a contribution for as little as $15 all the way up to $50, you can help make sure that this film is made. Please go to Indiegogo.com. That's Indie, I-N-D-I-E, Gogo, G-O-G-O, dot com, and type in the search, Tuning In Now 2. That's the number two. Tuning In Now with the number two. On Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, join host Philip Malika with the Consciousness Evolution Hour. Join Philip and his special guests and co-hosts as they discuss the shift, ascension, timelines, metaphysical concepts, and the fifth dimension. Find Philip at the Consciousness Evolution 2.0 group page on Facebook and on YouTube. On Friday, the Earth Experience with your host, Kalina Angel, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. The Earth Experience explores our soul's expansion through our human experience on Earth. Kalina will help you to navigate and expand through the exciting confusions that we are manifesting as new 5D beings. And now, our newest addition to Enlightenment Evolution Network 1, Victoria Vives Kyung, hosting Earth Sky People Radio, will now be with you on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard time 1 p.m eastern standard time for your start to an inspiring week this saturday november 29th she will share more powerful tips on how you can thrive on earth earth sky people radio your bridge between heaven and earth subjects will include planet earth becoming part of an intergalactic society star seeds and extraterrestrial life living in oneness with one another, with Mother Earth, and with life beyond Earth, the Interstellar Alliance, also known as the Galactic Federation of Light, music, frequency, and sound healing, question and answer interviews, shamanism, ancestral wisdom, and the star nations, self-sustainative and regenerative living, and much, much more. Go to victoriavives.com forward slash radio where people can start submitting questions for upcoming shows. Victoria's guest on Tuesday, November 18th is special guest 
Jessie Ann Nichols-George, sharing about her Compassion Tour and sharing tools with you for maintaining personal identity, being in crowds, and or being around those that may not share your interests or values. On Sundays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 a.m. Pacific, is my show, About Oneness. About Oneness is a weekly radio program focused on celebrating the ongoing conscious awakening of our planet and our realization of oneness. I'm an American originally from Charleston, South Carolina, now living in Europe, The Hague, the Netherlands. I'm an integrated channel, medium, Reiki master, and metaphysical teacher. I have a varied and diverse background, including that of being a singer, dancer, writer, as well as working in the sport, nutrition, and fitness world. As a channel, I bring forward the information of my non-physical guides called Theos, whose message is always that of oneness and unconditional love. This show for me is about integrating all of my experiences and following my highest excitement, which is tapping into the truth of the universe. If you would like to find more about me and my show and my upcoming guests, as well as see many videos and channelings and teachings, you can go to aboutoneness.com. On the Enlightenment Evolution Network 2, on Saturday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 6 p.m. Pacific, the Pied Piper and Texas Rebel hosting the show Disclosure Now. Disclosure Now is the On the Edge of Our Seats show that covers all topics of disclosure, from the world's most famous and obscure UFO cases to cryptozoology, conspiracies, and all things that go bump in the night. Pied Piper started his journey in Michigan in 1993 as a preteen seeing Bigfoot and never could get enough of investigating all things paranormal. Texas Rebel is a wild Texas man who loves the same journey and has studied these same things for years. Join them as they cover all things in the human experience that just cannot be answered by anyone. Listen here and call in on the number 347-215-8586. The Pied Piper and Texas Rebel will have as their guest on November the 22nd, Michael Horn, a Billy Meyer researcher. Coming soon on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1 p.m. Pacific, The Resonance and Tension, hosted by Soul and Neil Gar. The Resonance and Tension show is dedicated to all things frequency and vibration. They will showcase conscious musicians who infuse frequencies into their music and have set out to uplift and raise the vibration of humanity through their music. They will have in-depth discussions with various artists about their passion, purpose, and personal journey that led them to where they are now. Additionally, they will routinely have guests on the topics of free energy, technology, and other quantum modalities and technologies that are coming into existence now. The Resonance Intention is a platform for artists, musicians, and inventors to increase awareness of their personal approach in order to contribute to the paradigm shift we are currently within. And remember, you never have to miss any show on the Enlightenment Evolution Network 1 or 2. All shows are available to listen to again immediately after they air on playback. Also, now the EEN Networks 1 and 2 are archiving all videos for all of their shows weekly. From one day to three days at the latest, these shows will be uploaded on youtube.com forward slash network enlightenment. Or if you simply type Enlightenment Evolution Network in YouTube, you will find the network page. We will have individual show playlists with all of the last month's archives, and they will be updated every week. All right, back to the show. All right, you've been tuning in to Disclosure Now. This has been the second part of a three-part series. The first part with Michael Horn, the story. The second part. The Skeptic with <clears throat> Philip Langdon. Well, I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight and to tune in next week. Now, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>